rolling. This is the Fed Sock Films Podcast. Where we continue the conversation sparked, sparked on, on film. film. Quite on set. You wanna know what freedom tastes like? It tastes like this beer. Take one. This is in fact the classic solution in search of a problem. Action it cannot help but be controversial. Cut. With expert discussion and analysis. With the greatest legal minds on the topic today. The Fed Sock Films Podcast. It's a wrap. Welcome to the FedSoc Films Podcast. I'm Samantha Schroeder, Deputy Director of FedSoc Films. Today we have two professors from our film, Paul Carice and Michael Zugert, here to discuss John Locke and Baron de Montesquieu, the philosophers behind the founders. How did our founding fathers encounter uh, Locke and Montesquieu in college? And did Montesquieu read Locke? We have many, uh, we have many uh, um, catalogs of colonial libraries and of colonial syllabi and curriculum at the colonial universities. Um, And Locke was one of the most uh, uh, possessed uh, writers in those colonial libraries. Uh, So we know that he was very widely read, especially by the, you know, the educated stratum of the society. Remember this, what these were societies in which there was an educated um, elite and a lot of the you know, those were the people who were mostly doing the politics at that time. Um, and they were very often, if not always, reading Locke in their universities. This was still a time, um, let me back up, they were reading Locke in their universities directly, or they were reading versions of Locke and philosophy that came to them through other writers. So, for example, uh, Blackstone, who was an important uh, legal educator, much, uh, much of Blackstone incorporates Lockean theory, uh, as well as Montesquieu for that matter. And secondly, um, uh, there the Scottish Enlightenment philosophers who also were very popular in America at this time, uh, especially Francis Hutchinson. Hutchinson develops a, a, a theory of politics, which turns out is almost a paraphrase of Locke's. So many of them would have a, uh, a run across Locke in that context. Um, so Locke was very, very widely read, uh, and uh, uh, at the time of the revolution was the most cited philosopher uh, by American writers in the many, many pamphlets and various things that they produced at that time. You want to say something about Montesquieu and, the, and his presence? Yeah. Yes, about both Locke and Montesquieu, that uh, in part because of the culture of uh, letter writing, uh, which, which we don't quite have in the same way, and, and the culture of newspapers and other sorts of journals. Even a figure like George Washington, who because of his life circumstances didn't have a college education, he, he looks to certain figures as uh, guiding his thought. So once he begins to know figures like Jefferson and uh, Madison and Hamilton and Jay and others, he, he's reading public writings or letters, or so he was absorbing Locke's philosophy or Montesquieu's philosophy, even though we, we, we think, you know, we, we, as Michael said, we have records of particular libraries, public libraries and private libraries. We know, for example, that Montesquieu owned copies of Locke's uh, works. But even if Washington's library at Mount Vernon doesn't have <laughs> this, the second treatise of government or the two treatises of government or the spirit of laws, you can see in his writing that he's being careful to uh, read and observe uh, and, and find a sort of an American consensus on these important questions of rights or, or law or constitutionalism. And so you get an indirect uh, flow of these philosophers into the, the writing and thinking of an important uh, statesman. Let, let me add uh, one thing to this. Um, Uh, And this relates to the point I made earlier about the amalgam between Lockean philosophy and Protestantism in America. It turns out if you look at the sermons, the preaching by the preachers of the day, uh, when they talk about politics, they are actually presenting Locke. That may be surprising, but almost all of the well, may, maybe that's too strong. I don't know what all of them were saying, but if we look at at uh, selections of the preaching that we have records of, uh, you'll see how amazingly present Locke was in that writing. So most of them, when they spoke about politics, presented to their congregations uh, 
the basic outlines of Lockean philosophy. And that turns out to be very important because the, uh, as I said, there's an educated stratum of the society of people who have their own libraries, people who went to university, people who are read in uh, these big high powered books. But most of the people, of course, are not do are not doing that then as now. Um, but when they went to church, which most of them did, uh, they heard Locke, especially in those years leading up to the revolution, when everybody was very excited about the political issues of the day, that what they heard in the from the pulpit was basically Lockean philosophy. You know, Mike, we should also mention that there weren't law schools oh, uh, separate. Uh, separate uh, curriculum and faculty. The education and the law happened in part through colleges, uh, integrated into a broader liberal arts education, as we would call it. Uh, so one would encounter, one's thinking about becoming a lawyer, uh, but one would encounter these important texts of philosophy, uh, including modern enlightenment philosophy, including Locke and Montesquieu in, in a general curriculum. And then if, if one is reading as a law student, so to speak, Blackstone, as Michael mentioned, you know, Montesquieu is the first modern philosopher cited in the commentaries on the laws of England. Locke's cited and Locke's influences throughout uh, the commentaries. And then I'll mention one further element. Because of the Anglo-American political culture, there are juries and there are legal responsibilities distributed beyond uh, people in the narrow particular kinds of offices that we would think about now. So again, somebody like George Washington, who's not a university student or graduate, he, he's not a, a lawyer, but he has broader legal responsibilities, including jury service, which would require him to have some knowledge of, he's never read Blackstone directly, uh, but he's, again, he's, got, he's absorbing a, a legal constitutional philosophical culture and indirectly getting Locke and, and Montesquieu and, and Blackstone that way. So you're saying that your best advice for law school students is to download um, Locke and Montesquieu uh, for their Kindle and carry it around with them <laughs> like their uh, legal Bible. <laughs> and, I don't know about their legal Bible, but it'd be a great help to have. Yeah, and look for law schools or law professors that incorporate some of this uh, education in the origins of our political and constitutional order, as well as more detailed study of, of particular legal issues and questions. So what works by Locke and Montesquieu do you think are most crucial for law school students to be reading um, to form their education? Well, let me say about Locke, um, I, I'd say two works in particular. His second treatise on government, although that second treatise is um, made much more intelligible if one reads the first treatise along with it, which is not commonly done, but it ought to be done more often. But the second treatise for sure, and uh, the letter on toleration, I would say those are the two main works that uh, by Locke that one um, definitely ought to read. Uh, could mention a few others if they were, if you have a lot of extra time, but I know our law students are very busy, so I'll leave it at those two. And for Montesquieu, it would be a work published in 1748 and quickly translated into English called The Spirit of the Laws or The Spirit of Laws. And there are particular chapters, <clears throat> excuse me, there are, <clears throat> excuse me, there are particular chapters or books in it, very influential for the American framers of our constitutional order and Bill of Rights. Um, and those pr pretty readily be found. It's book, book 11 has a long discussion of a Constitution and constitutionalism of liberty. England is one. <clears throat> England is one focus, but there are monarchies in Europe that could have a mixed or balanced monarchy that also protect liberty. Book twelve actually is about the institutions of courts and professional judges, um, who are a crucial constitutional element protecting uh, liberty and and the rule of law. Uh, and there's also a chapter on the political culture of England. It's often book 19 um, that actually describes for us many important elements, uh, whether we like them or not, of our current political culture, like partisanship and, and uh, parties, but also how the, the actual practice of religious liberty uh, occurs in everyday, 
English political life. If you could pick one idea from Locke and from Montesquieu that should be the key takeaway for law school students, um, what key ideas do you think they should be thinking about? Um, that all men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that are among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that uh, just powers of government derive from the consent of the government in order to secure these rights, that set of rights, that, that set of ideas. It's the, the package, maybe not just one idea. For Montesquieu, it's the idea that a constitution and the rule of law is needed to sustain political liberty and that a constitution is a complicated thing and quite a, an achievement because there are written or institutional elements to it, but there's also a constitutional culture. There's a set of habits and, and beliefs. One metaphor you could use is there's a hardware, but there's also a software. Uh, and um, the, there are philosophical elements and, and religious elements, and then more particular legal elements of a whole constitutionalism uh, of liberty. And, and I would add, if you have a, Montesquieu would say, if you have a constitution of liberty in this particular legal sense and in a broader cultural sense, uh, you ought to cherish it and accept that, of course, it needs revision and adaptation and debates about whether you're living up to it, but you should not take it for granted. You, you should work, work with it. <laughs> And, and, and not casually neglect it or leave it aside. That was all fascinating. Thank you, Professor Carice and Professor Zuckert for joining me today. And thank you for all the law school students out there who are listening in rapture to all six episodes of The Philosophers Behind the Founders. To continue the conversation on Locke and Montesquieu, subscribe to our new show, the FedSoc Films Podcast, wherever you listen. You can check out the film, The Philosophers Behind the Founders, on YouTube, Facebook, or on our website, fedsoc.org. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot O-R-G. This has been a FedSoc audio production.